Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Terry Hawkness. Today, Keith Bartlett is our special guest. We're going to talk about his amazing journey, a lifetime in music. You've done so many things, so we're going to cover a lot of stuff. Let's go back to the beginning. You, Your father was very musical himself. So yeah, let's my hear father, about him a bit. George Bartlett. Well, he... Um, He was, his fingers were too big to play a musical instrument. His, he was a workman, a farmer, workman, a logger by when he was a kid. So he couldn't even play the piano because his fingers wouldn't fit between the keys. That's how big they were. But uh, So his thing was singing and singing harmony, and that's what he taught us to do early on. And he would hand me instruments, and if they were stringed instruments, which is, his interest was, they'd be in tune, like he would tune me. Right. So, Where do you think he got his musical ability? Well, uh... The people that he grew up with, like his mother has a, his, my grandmother has a treaty number and she married an Englishman and so when he died young, when my dad was like in, still in elementary school, he was the youngest, so they kind of, you know, lived by, in Holbein between Prince Albert and Shellbrook was, was, but in those days, like, they didn't have anything, so they just, they, they, they hunted and, and, uh, Played music, got a hold of instruments and sang gospel music, and so the whole family would, whatever instruments they could get a hold of, the popular ones on the day, then it would have been a guitar or accordion or, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. So they all sang, and that's what they did. And when I used to go and visit them when we were a kid, they'd all sing, just sit around and sing. So that's where he got it. We just that's what they did. And so you got hooked at a very young age yourself. So then he married my mother, and she played the piano, but that was his, that's a whole story how they got together, but that was on a farm, and my mother was an only child, and her parents were old, and so he married into the farm, but that was in the prairies, that's when he first came out of, uh, what was the forest in those days. So growing up there, uh, he taught he, he taught us to sing, he taught us to sing, riding in the car, on the tractor, even he'd take us out on the tractor, sing and when my brother was a year younger than I, my brother Glenn, when he could sing the melody, then my dad would be already, I would have been learning a harmony from my dad. And then he'd sing another part and another part. And he was just a natural at intervals, hearing intervals and singing harmonies. So that's where I started. And so you lined up doing a lot of things with your younger brother, all with music? Well, when we were, we used to sing on stage. Like, yeah, he put on the, there used to be a thing in Saskatchewan called the ACT Amateur Show. And it was a charity thing by... Association of uh, Traveling, Associ- Associated Travelers. Like, they were salesmen, but it was a service club. And then they would run radio shows, and CFQC Radio used to come out to town halls and broadcast. Perhaps you've heard of it before. So it what, was like, this is back in the about? 50s when I was a little kid. Early 50s, Nat. And uh, they would come with a stage band, CFQC, uh, Dennis Fisher, and the Plains one. So they'd come to your town, and they'd hook up a thing through the telephone line, and it was actually really good quality. And then broadcast from halls and they'd have these competitions and then uh, people would phone in pledges to raise money for charity if they liked what you did over the radio and everybody would listen. So. Do you remember initially having stage fright or any issues or no. this, this, this was your calling? No, he, we would just go out on stage, my, my brother and I'd sing. We would have some accompaniments and we'd play the piano for us and I'd so, sing harmony with my brother and we were five and six, seven or eight after my mom died, seven or eight, nine, ten years old and I'm in there. And so this would air live on the radio? It would air live on the radio. And, and then, had also and then, a live audience? Yeah, a live audience in the hall, but a live radio audience all over the province, yeah. you know. And then they would have finals, semi-provincial finals and provincial finals. Of, and so what kind yeah. of songs would you have performed? <sighs> well, I can remember singing Bless This House, So Lord We Pray, Harmony with My Brother. Yeah. Churchy music, that was my grand, my mom's thing but my mom had passed on by then when we were young uh, and uh, I, some Irish tune called Benjamin's Stream anything where there could be nice harmony parts was a company my dad would kind of choose the pieces and say this you should sing this this is nice but then some kind of musical like stuff of the day Patty Page numbers or whatever pop stuff Anyway, this is... Do you remember really listening to, like, current radio music? Did you, at that young age, pay attention? Here's yet? perhaps my dad's greatest contribution in my parents, was that they allowed, they realized early on that I was captivated by music. And uh, uh, I can remember being in my piano, in my pajamas, when I was before school age, like, 
four, five, six years. And they would let me lay on the kitchen counter all day almost with the, there was a radio on the counter and you could turn the dial and listen to all this different music. And my most parents would have said, okay, you've laid there long enough, get out of those pajamas and, you know, get your clothes on and go and gather the eggs, which I had to do eventually, gather the eggs. But no, they would let me listen. And I would always listen to the stuff my dad liked country and western music best. But I would always go back to the CBC because I can remember as a kid listening to like every kind of music that would come on there, like the diversity. I remember like jazz bands and Phil Nimmons and nine, like when I was five or six years old, I remember telling my mother, like, so it must have been six, like, music has rules, and, 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 but when they play jazz, it's like, I can remember these words I'm saying, but when, you, but with jazz, it's like you take the rules and you throw them all up in the air, and then when they fall down, then you play with them, kind of, and I remember my mother looking at me, saying, like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So the point is, they, they nurtured, they allowed me to obsess about music, yeah. Tell me about the Lone Ranger guitar. Well, my dad had a hunting buddy named, whose name, interestingly enough, was Manly Newman. So there's an early childhood influence for you. You can see. And uh, he was uh, he wasn't married, but they would hunt together, and we would stop in his house, and it was like his it was a farm homestead. His dad had homestead, and on the wall was his guitar, but he would never like I would see it. And we would be on some hunting trip, and we'd stop in there and clean the scopes or whatever. Go, and this guitar would be there. And I can remember, I guess, walking by it, I would hear my voice or voices resonate in it, and I would stop and look at it. I kept telling him to take it down. I said, "Oh, that thing, that old thing, leave it up there." So one day, I he, I persisted, and he took it off the nail. And he was a bachelor, so he blew the dust off it, tuned it a little bit, and then like he sort of. Sat maybe played like an A seventh chord, like, and I heard that. And then he sang some little songs about fishies ran over the dam. That's all I remember. And then he just put it, handed it to me. And that I just, that was it. And then he told me to take it home. And I didn't know the strings weren't supposed to be almost an inch off the fingerboard. I didn't know the neck was warped and the top was buckled and it had a palm tree here and the Lone Ranger there and it was a catalog guitar. And I played it till, like. You go beyond calluses, it's so hard, and it was so big, heavy steel strings. And I didn't know, and then, you know, they'd get blisters and then they'd break. I can actually remember it, it was bleeding a little bit, but I just kept coming back to it and stop. I just couldn't. Yeah. So I just put my head down, near, ear on the guitar like that, and I still do that sometimes. I just listen, just listen to the sounds inside. So that was it. It was later I discovered that guitars didn't have to be that hard, but I'm still coasting on the energy I put into that. <laughs> so what would you have tried to learn right at the beginning? Well, they, my dad liked country songs, and this guy, they, he liked to sing, so then he eventually started playing a few tunes, and like it would be like country and western stuff that he liked, like, you know, what, like what, well, from the 50s. So about what year I was like 13 when I started, it says when I was 45, so 58, 15. 59, yeah, yeah, around in there. Yeah, when I was 13, 14, 15. And you were going to high school in Rosetown? When I started, I went to high school in Rosetown by bus, yeah. And did that change your attitude with music at all, being around other kids who are now are starting to find music, maybe just to, you know, stay caught up with... Okay, yeah, already, two things were happening during that time, so... Uh, well, by the time I was 15, 14, 15, like I was, oh, the first people that I played with when, when I got really going on it, besides the, the country songs that my friend, my friend was, oh, I don't know, like Webb Pierce, Kitty Wells, kind of stuff, you know, we'd sing and I'd learn the chords and that. But then, the, as it maybe before I really got involved in high school, in grade nine or t in there, my dad would take me over to the neighbor's place because in those days I was fortunate to live, grow up in a time when people played music socially. It was j often with families and then other people who were friends of those guys who actually played music, but the people would gather. So, and it seemed like almost every, any night of the week, and certainly on weekends, people would play music together. It just it sounds strange to even recount because it sure heck isn't happening today like anywhere. There's many other things to do with one's time. But I went over to this neighbor's farmhouse, and these people were old, Albert and Viola Hamilton. 
they were retired, like they were like 80, you know, and they had been in dance bands in the 30s, like they had played, he played C melody sax, she played piano, and he knew, like he'd say, four flats, viola, and I would sit there, and she'd play all these chords, and it was like, you know, swing stuff, eh, like uh, from the from the era, yeah. with all, like, sometimes like four chords to the measure, chink, 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 and she would kind of go, and he'd say, four flats, viola, and I'd have to find, oh, it was A flat, and how to play, because I would, by ear, I'd play along, and she, they didn't, she just, play, she just intuitively played all, all these eight chords and stuff. And he played stuff, so, in eight different keys, so that was a musical education before I ever got to high school with that stuff. And then there was another band in the neighborhood, started up, they used to hire me to go out and play with them, they were actually working along with family orchestra, dances in small towns, like our small halls and stuff. So by the time I got to high school, like, I was used to being a guitarist. So I wasn't singing anymore like I had been as a kid. I, in fact, I never started singing again until I was like in my late 20s, like when I re tried to reconcile, you know, playing and singing at the same time. Mm -hmm. I became an instrumentalist. So by the time I got to high school, there were other people that played there, and there was a band we had called, we formed while I was in grade 11, 12. Once I could drive myself there with a car that I could buy gas for with my earnings. <laughs> we There was a band called The Tempests, and... Uh, you know, there was a... So what kind of music did they play? Well, a combination of the dance band stuff, because we could get jobs for the Rosetown Dance Club, and they would do... They wanted to do, like, couples dancing kind of thing, but then there was also rock and roll happening, and we would just do cover... We would do the get into stuff by the Fireballs, and the Ventures was just coming out, you know, because then I'd get a rhythm guitar player, and uh, or we had, a, like, a couple of those guys... I mean, I know their, their name. Gary Clark was on trumpet, and Cam Johnson was on saxophone. He was Cam. Gary's from Rosetown. Cam was from Glamis, and then another lad from Glamis, Hugh McDonald, played rhythm guitar. I was the lead guitar player. Bob Thrasher was at the rehearsals were at his house, and he was a drummer in Rosetown. So we would meet after school. And we would play, and then we said we even started playing for school dances. Then we started renting halls around and playing for our own dances. Right? You get your own friend to take money at the door, and you rent the hall. Put up a poster. In those days, a poster in any town. And people would come from miles around. Just one poster is all you needed. Just yeah. dance Friday night, the ponds. Yeah. And not the uh, not the ponds. That was the Tempest before they formed. The Tempest. Where, what would you have done for like PA speakers, microphones, mm, everything back that's then? That's a good question. I'm having a little trouble remembering what we did for a PA system. I remember one by the time the ponds came. What would we have done? I suppose I think what we would have done was there was like. Hmm. Very good question. I don't remember that. Like, you certainly didn't use anything for your amps and the drums. It would just be for vocals or for the saxophone. I don't know if I... The early bands I played, there was no PA system. You just played. Well, I, I, my first electric guitar, why I could play, was made by the... Before, I mean, I got an electric guitar after that. My dad got one, traded wheat for one. After that, I went beyond the neighbor's guitar. And it plugged in, but my first amp was made by the electrician in Harris, Ernie Thomas. He had an electric shop, and he took a tel television, and uh, the he took the amplifier out of the television set, added some more tubes, put a quarter-inch line input in, and a yes. <laughs> separate volume control, and that was the chassis. And then my dad built a cabinet, and they put a 10-inch speaker in it, and then this chassis sat on the, it was open in the back. We had a handle, cupboard drawer handle, made of wood. And that was my guitar amp. And then he did the same thing for a TV at home, and I could plug into the TV and play along with Chet Atkins or play along with... He actually set it up so that it was a big old black and white TV with cabinet model, and then there was a jack in the front, and I could plug my guitar, and then I could control my volume and the TV volume, and then I could try to fit in, and then the Ed Sullivan show would come on, you see it, so then I'd be like playing along with everybody that I could. Even if it was just a few notes. If I didn't, I didn't have, always understand all the... Music, everything from big band to jazz to different things, right. but I could still balance, blend, blend it right and then balance yeah. it. Isn't that interesting? I never thought of that before. So by the time that was my first amp, but in the for PA systems, we probably used something like out of a school, like a you know, like they used to use those bogans for the school auditorium, like in, in a, I don't know, some so any box with a speaker in it. Right. That was that was not just for. Did you take any music classes ever in, in public school? 
Well, there was so much music in public schools. When I was first in a one-room country school, Silver Cloud by my farm, like every day, uh, this ra uh, the CBC school radio broadcast came on. And it was like you'd stop everything and the teacher would turn the big radio on and then both of it was multi-grade classrooms and we'd all sit there and get to play with plasticine and make stuff and listen. And I can remember hearing like, I remember this day, well, I must have been in grade two because by grade three I went to Harris, but I can remember that little one-room schoolhouse. Or no, was that in Harris later? But we, even then it continued. Every, like the school broadcast, I remember hearing this melody that was just intriguing and it was... And it was green sleeves. And I remember just listening to it and saying, whoa, listen, hearing all the parts move. And then there was words to it, but I wasn't very interested in that. But then I found out that Henry VIII actually composed the music for green sleeves. Isn't that amazing? He may have been a bad husband and, and perhaps not a good king. Well, he must have been a good king because he hired musicians to play on barges and he composed music for them. Yeah. That's one of those things. So yeah, that was be that's when there was a real music, and of course teachers all sang and played the piano. So there was that. Do you remember uh, like Christmas hot. assemblies? Or oh anything? yeah, concerts and stuff. Yeah. Always played at that. The town started a school band by George Tosh. He was a local farmer who was a jazz musician, really, but went back to farm for his dad, and he was one of the first jazz musicians in Saskatchewan. I think he went to Vancouver, came back. I just played at his 90th birthday the other day. Yes, and uh, he started a town band and ordered in some of the top people out and everybody learned how to play them. And yeah, he, so my brother and I were in that. I played trumpet and then baritone horn in that. But by high school, there was an operetta. There was a woman named Mrs. Margaret Pinckney and her, she would uh, organize operettas and music. She taught music voice classes, but I never took formal classes. So. So The Tempest is your first band. How, how would you have got to be in that band? Who, who started it and how did you become the guy? Well, I, I don't know if I was the guy in that band. It was just like there was a couple of them had like, they were playing like old people music like for dance. They were being recruited to play for dances and they were playing like, you know, trumpet sax and did they, have a, they didn't have a piano player. But they needed, actually they wanted to come together they could play a bit. I, they had learned how to play on these instruments but by the time I got there I was just recruited or we just kind of, just the drummer became my friend. He started at a basement. We could have rehearsals there so we just kind of formed the band out of what was available what we could do. And how long did this band last? Oh through, through high school like uh, I, w I remember after high school the funny thing was I graduated in grade 12. Graduation was coming up but we already had this summer job at Clearwater Resort, which is by Kyle, Saskatchewan, south of Rosetown. And so high school is ending, but we had that like weekend job at Clearwater. So so I am so then uh, previous summers I'd worked for other farmers nearby, hired myself out, but this summer I was going to do that. So I wanted to, but it just seemed too far away from the farm, so I had to move to Rosetown. So another friend and I was graduating. We got in a an apartment and a hot plate together in Rolstown and an old one of those old buildings had apartments and then we got job for a Roscoe construction company in the summer so we could have a real job so we could play it on the weekend our resort it caught so that was the summer so we played there all what that year summer. is that and that would have been the year I graduated from high school 63 the funny thing is that I remember being on that we built the McLeod store as it then was on Main Street in Rolstown among other projects and I'm just thinking about the music, thinking about the weekend. And I'm thinking about, wow, it's Thursday, it's going to be tomorrow's Friday, and then we'll be going to play at Clearwater or whatever. And I'm, this guy's calling up to me, I'm tarring the roof, and he's down on the ground. And there's a guy I knew from high school, it wasn't really a good friend, Terry Totten. And he said, hey, Keith, and I, he could see me up on the roof. He said, hey, do you want to be my roommate? And I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, in Saskatoon. I said, Saskatoon? He says, well, yeah. He says, i got a place to live for, I'm going, to, for going to university, but I need... Someone to, it's like a board and a room place, but there's a room with another, that I need to share it with another person. What? Yeah, when? I say, well, that's for you. Say, what? And all of a sudden, some weird start turning, and I realized that this is the last, this Friday is actually the last gig at the Clearwater. This summer's over. Actually, my job's ending this week. But on Wednesday of that week, or whatever this day was, I, I was that focused on the music that I didn't realize. I had no forward thinking at all. I was just like, 
right there in the moment. That was pretty characteristic, I think, of a lot of us who were involved in music. It was just like, I mean, it just be, took over your, that's all you thought about, right? You just love doing it so much. So then I said, yeah, okay, fine. And so that's how I ended up going to university. I had no plans, but I, now I had a, a roommate, so I went to Saskatoon and September, when you're supposed to register, and I remember trying to figure out what to take in the lineup, and then I find this place I'm going to live with him. But that's when I started in with when we formed the band, The Pawns, was during that year, because the Tempest so, didn't survive right. leaving high school. Who were the original members of The Pawns, and how did it start? Well, while I was playing in The Tempest, there was this guy named Sterling McLeod from Bounty, a farm boy who played a bit of piano, a bit of guitar. And he decided to create, he'd already been to university for one year and met a couple of people there you know, who, who had talent, who could sing and, and play. And one of them was Don Myrell from Fox Valley, who was in first year Aggie, had been before I got there. And, and he could sing and play rhythm guitar like crazy. And so he, this, so Sterling came and recruited me while I was still playing with the Tempest and said, when you come to Saskatoon, we're going to start this band and it's going to be really great. There was this vocalist from Webb, Garth Gatsky. These guys were all in agriculture, it turned out. Yeah. And they were all really talented. So that was, I just got recruited. That's how, well, by the time I got to Saskatoon, then we started yeah. finally meeting and rehearsing and started playing from there. And so initially the band was formed, and what was the goal of the band? Well, in those days, most people did cover tunes. We did cover tunes of what was happening and what people were dancing to and listening to the radio. But I've been thinking a lot about that lately because I've always felt, later on, I always felt a little bit like, uh, what's the word? Well, un, it, like it was kind of delegitimized by, by bands who actually started recording their own, writing and recording their own material, right? Which in hindsight then for a while seemed like, oh, that was obviously the real action. And, but now I have a different take on it altogether, because as Keith Jarrett, the, my one of my piano heroes that I listen to a lot, and listen to his arrangements, and I'm spending a lot more time playing piano these days because I can hear more and ten fingers going. You know, so, but as he put in the '90s called uh, standards, and all the jazz critics panned it horribly, like because he'd been this jazz, cutting edge jazz piano player. But when he put this album out of standards, they they they're pretty well all just the critics just who this sellout, you know, like critics were important in those because they would actually legitimize the recording and that's how they made and breed people who were stars. Right. Keith Jarrett said, oh, it's not about the material, it's about what the artist brings to the material, see? And when I, when, I, when, I, when I said that, I realized that was absolutely true. Like, it's never about this, he can play somewhere over the rainbow he does it, and you can look on YouTube. He did it in 2007, he did 2009, he did it in 1984 in Tokyo. Keith Jarrett has played Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Not only is every version different, but every time he goes through the verse, it's different. Like, he never plays the same accompaniment, the same rhythm, the same thing. So when I look back at what we did with the Pawns, we did cover tunes of pop tunes, everything from Ricky Nelson to... This time I drink to whatever was happening, but the Beatles as they came along, we did their stuff. But the thing was, like we had three guys who could sing in any kind of harmonies, and we could do our own arrangements. Like when we did a Beatle tune, we never tried to do it exactly like the Beatles did it. We, you know, you use the material. Or with any of the pop tunes, we would, our arrangements were, you know, they, we would bring something to it. So that's that's what, that's what our goal was just to become the best band. And actually, the goal, too, was to establish rock and roll on campus because there never had been rock and roll on, on university campus. So we, I remember we packed the lower mob one night and the varsity band was playing upstairs. And then in the gym, we, I remember we would play in the gym and it would, there's just no room to dance, just shoulder to shoulder full. But prior to that, it had been like, the idea was that university students were more serious and should have serious music to listen to. Like, yeah, rock and roll was an invasion. Right. So I would say in 1964, the Ponds were probably the most popular group at the university. Oh yeah, at the you university. played a lot of Good. a lot of events there. All the grads, engineering grad, ag grad, like all the you know commerce grad, law grad, like all the colleges wanted us to play their right. functions. Yeah. What but, was the difference between playing the upper mub and the lower mub? Well, just the fact that the legitimate dance was upstairs in the upper mub, but somehow Sterling, who could talk his way into anything. 
decided to give us a stage down by the vending machines in the lower mob, which was the lounge. But that, when once we started playing, the music filtered out and people came out of the residences and anyway, just like, it just, they came from the upstairs, from the dance upstairs, they came down, because we were louder, because we had amplification. Right, okay. And the band was a quartet right from the start? Uh, well, it was often a quintet because we would often, because once we started making money, we could hire people. And I mean, we hired like Brian Abbott, this monster sax player who played with uh, Garnet Spears from North Belfort before our time, but he was like, he could really play. Yeah, and we would, you know, then later you'd have a keyboard player and so on. Do you remember any specific Pawns gigs that stand out in your mind for being special, whether it was just a good night or a good crowd? Or... Oh, well, in terms of like, you know, in terms of fame and glory, I, I mean, the, the grandstand shows with the Gala Night Under the Stars in 65 in Regina, Saskatoon, and then also in Regina, Saskatoon, the actual exhibition grandstand show, which is another deal. It's how we played we play those things. And those were big crowds. And, uh, but then after that gala night, after the spin-off from that, then we went, we formed the, the gala night review and we went out and booked arenas and played there. And we had like, the, on that show, we had other people who had been contestants in the gala night. See, we never got any money out of that whole deal. Everybody but paid, but got paid but the musicians. And we realized that, right? Like, as it was happening, Lauren Green is riding up and down the elevator with him and the Greystone singers are in the background. I'm sure they got paid. Maybe they did. And and then the Saskatoon Symphony was the backup band and the backup singers. And then the T V and the and the all oh, the odd and the people bought tickets and the grandstands were full. We never they put us up in a hotel. I remember the hotel Saskatchewan Regina in Saskatoon we still stayed home. We never got any money. <laughs> so we went on the road. We formed our Jeff Howard who had Smokey's Cabin and CFQC. We had meetings together and then we hired this electric cordovox player to round out to take the place of the Saskatoon Symphony, and we reproduced it. He had a, he could do anything on the cordovox, right? So then our band would back up like a few, a couple of the other acts, but and then we would play a dance after. So those are huge events in arenas around. But we always continued to play our own arenas as the pawns, like we we had because we had a TV show, so we could arrange where we were, announce where we were coming and so. Right. Tell me about. Working but with Louise here. Can I just is. can I just back up a little bit? Yeah. That isn't necessarily the most memorable night. You asked me the most memorable yeah. night, like the of when the pawns played, and I'm still thinking about that. But there would be there would have been, like in, that was in terms of numbers or whatever f f exposure. F but in terms of, in terms of just the the. In terms of the, the most memorable nights, I think, where the music was just like so good. It would have to have been like in Unity, I think, because we had, for somehow the Unity Arena, they had like an upstairs, a, like there was a, a big dance hall. It's still there, but I haven't been in it for years, but I live close to there again now. But we would play there every second Saturday night, and people would come for big miles around. And there were nights there when uh, when Louise was singing with us then I think in Unity a lot and we would travel on the station wagon we'd have our clothes and we'd come in and it was just like being you know like being a star because we had this TV show so you come into town but the the quality of the crowd the the the, the music the sound that we would get in that hall and I think I remember that as being the most most nice. magical part of it was see rock and roll really works in halls it's the sound it's the size of the hall that and the resonance of the hall, like it never did work in stadiums very much, rock and roll, or in outdoor parks. You can right. do it, but it's not the same as that coming and paying your two bucks or your five bucks, coming around and going into the hall and having that Fender bass amp hit you right in the chest. Like, right. Right. Whoa. And the guitars, you get your, we used to spend a long time, we used to talk about getting your tone, eh? So you have your guitar and you have your Fender amp or whatever, but you're always looking every hall until you, and people would say, yeah, after the second set, yeah, he really got his tone right. So you'd find that getting your tone was a ex common expression. It had to do with the interaction in the hall. So those kind of moments in, in the halls were the most, were the most amazing experience. So if, did you actually market yourself as a rock and roll band playing those kind of dances? And if so, I no, was say, no, no. Who, it was no, who is your no. audience? The audience was an, was anybody over like from fifth fourteen to thirty 
25, 30, you know, because yeah, okay. drinking age was 21, but that was confined to the bars. And when we played in town, people would come out of the bars to the hall, people would travel a long ways. Anybody, anybody who could do his parents would let him go, you know, to the hall in towns. And then, but, but actually the youth m movement of the day was pretty well, right, you know, right. up to 30. And there was always a few people in there who would buy beer for younger people and that, and that was like. I suppose, but we never like we didn't we didn't have riotous. We always we were we hired farm boys to be bouncers. We never allowed any booze in or any drunkenness or any rowdiness. If people came in and wanted to make trouble, we we didn't hire fighters, but we hired big farm boys with thick necks who could just pick somebody up and throw them over the bushes. Like <laughs> so, we had we 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 ran really kind of clean things because none of us had much appetite for. That's good. Drunken and rowdiness, yeah. Okay, so fill us in. How does Louise become part of the group? Oh, like most things, Sterling discovered her somewhere. He was the advanced scout. He was the person always thinking about the next thing, yeah. Sterling McLeod. He was the manager, and that's why to this day I still don't know how to make any money with music. He did that. I, we had a reunion, like his 50th wedding anniversary recently. Is that impossible? But it was also, since the band was his best man, it was also a band <laughs> reunion, which yeah. may have, sorry, Don, it may have eclipsed the 50th anniversary. But so we actually got together and sat, read, read through his set, still played some stuff. But but Louise would have, would have been Sterling's discovery somewhere. You heard her sing. She was like, you know, high school girl, and she could, or maybe just finishing high school. I just remember all of a sudden showing up to, to, to rehearse and, and play with this girl and she opened her mouth and this like bird came, song bird came, she could sing just like <sighs> So then okay, so that was all there was to that because once she can sing like that, we just want to keep her, just want her to keep singing so we'd work out. Like her biggest hits were like, Let It Be Me, I Bless The Day I Found You, Downtown by Petula Clark, like which in a sense like were covers, but on the other sense, I had this arranging ideas all the time, so you know we didn't. I was always wearisome to try to reproduce something exactly. They already did that, but what could you get the gist of it? But then what can we do? And then same with our backup harmonies and stuff, because we could all sing around her. So we'd come up with what these arrangements were that we really liked. So that's how she just appeared, and she could sing. And so as that, by the time that Galenite competition came in, they're looking for Saskatchewan talent. I love this, right? You got to audition, and they select finalists. I, I'm kind of kind of say I love it because they never paid us any money, and I'm still kind of thinking, isn't that always the way? Like everybody gets paid, even the people that sweep up after get paid. But don't get me started, okay? I'm over, I'm all right now. I'm okay. I'm over now. So <laughs> I'm all good. did she become a full time member? Perform oh, yeah. every show oh, yeah. at that point? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. We went on the road together. And so. How long was she with the group? That's so hard to say. I think. Was she not there very like long. to the end when you no, said it ended? No, 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 no. In fact, so there was that Galenade Under the Stars thing, and I think that the, maybe the, the finals were in June or something, or like it was summer because it was outdoor, but it was not early because it was in. Then later in the summer, we went on the road with the show. Wait a minute, was she with the show? Yes, she was. So anyway, our, competi our, con our contest was, thir we won third prize. The first prize winner was Ivan McNabb from Gordon's. Right, from uh, Panishai, Ituna, Ituna, Gord, Ivan. And Ivan, re and I, re this is another story, but we just reconnected later in life. I actually produced a recording for him of some of his, he was a wonderful singer. And uh, I met him out at Palmaker at, 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 uh, at uh, by accident, and we reconnected. And I met him, we, we were friends in our 20s, but he was a little older than I was. So he recorded these two albums, and I produced them in North Belfort, and I got some, my studio musicians together, Rod Salome and Dave Tupper and others, and we did this really good. And the name of the album was It's About Time, because <laughs> he had never actually had a really good quality album. Yeah. So he was like, uh, he was uh, on this, he won first, and he got to go to an episode of Bonanza, that was his prize, from Galenite Under the Star 65. He got to hold the chief's horse in a brief scene. He had an Indian costume on, and everybody thought he was going to sing or something, but he did. And there was a brief moment, if you knew it was coming, when the chief came to have words with Ben Cartwright about all that. There's this, he got, he came running up to hold the chief's horse, and then he was gone. That was his first prize, right? 
Uh, the Troubadours got the second prize. The, the Vic Zelensky and what, Terry, Terry, what was their names? They were singing trio group, folk group. They got second prize. Their prize was uh, a trip to Hawaii. Now, so one of, the, one of the three of them was getting married right then. So decided to go to Hawaii, but had to pay his bandmates two-thirds of the value of the trip. Plus he had to pay for his wife, right? So that was his trip. And then we, our prize was Luis got a scholarship to Pasadena Playhouse in California, this theater, the performing arts. And when she got there, it was closed for the summer and there's nobody there, except there was a seamstress lady who lived in this facility where they met and rehearsed and worked and worked on costumes. So Luis stayed there with her for a while and sold costumes and then came back. Hmm. Are you getting is you getting a pattern here of what <laughs> the, the musicians <laughs> but then there was all that exposure you see so we that's where we Sterling of course realized well yeah. we'll capitalize on this so we went out and put on our sh right. traveling road show and we made money on that right and plus there was a gala album that was, there was recorded but I don't remember ever seeing any money from that yeah do you remember but, how so, that came about who yeah put that together and. But but before you, so your question, after Louise came back from her summer at Pasadena Playhouse, yeah. so buttons on call, she didn't actually get to sing while she was there, or the performing arts didn't really get explored beyond costume repair, that was right. her. But then she decided to go to England, and she actually sang in music hall, like like there, okay. so... Uh, that was great. So that's so she left. So it was must have been soon. So it must have been briefly in '65 that she was in a band, like maybe for a year, no more than a year. It's funny I can't remember the exact dates, yeah. but yeah. Okay, so I was yeah. saying about the gala. You yeah. there's one album, and actually, is there even two albums? I think there's well, the two Ponks gala did some albums recordings, that came out. but there was a green. Yeah, I have the I have the Gala and the Stars album with. Yeah. Well, do you so, have a picture of it or what? There's two. Uh, I remember I'm, one. Of them. I'm pretty sure I've seen on the internet <clears> that there actually was two albums that somebody really wanted to cash in. The first one sold really well, so they must have said it. did? Two. I think it must have. I know that even. Or at least for. Was <laughs> it, was it Lumby people. that put it John out? Lumby, yeah. yeah that's so right. Maybe, Lumby Productions. Maybe for yeah. his quota, it was good enough for him yeah. to go yeah. do another one. Do you remember anything? Was this your first recording studio kind of sessions? Yeah, the Pawns, we did some, we did some, I think, I have a record at home of the Pawns, it's not with Louise, but just like with the Pawns, like I'm singing so Walt Holt or then. something else. Earlier or later, I don't know. Lumbe Productions, yeah. And then there's the Rudy Heineke, I'm sure we did something at his, but it's also too long, I just don't remember now, yeah. 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 Hmm. Interesting. But it was, anyway, the album, Galilee Under the Stars, it had the Pawns, and it had Ivan McNabb, and it had... The Troubadours, and it had Jeff Howard. I think that was it. That who was on that album? Okay. Yeah, I have it at home actually. And then you had a few cuts each. On it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Three, I think, two or three cuts each. And tell me about this TV show. It's when, how long? How did that? Well, come lots of to people be? apparently have played on Teens on TV. It was a long-running CFQC production, but I just remember our part of it. I th like okay. it was like. We were actually regulars on it for a while, so it was like it was our show when we when we were right. in our minds it was. But I, I was interested to read in your um, history about other people who played the history of people who played there. But there was a whole culture there on CFQC, I'll tell you that. And then Gordy Brandt used to play jazz there, and there was, and then um, uh, you know the the cast and crew were Jerry, our drummer at that time, then Jerry McLaughlin actually worked for CFQC TV as an artist. In those days, everything had to be painted by hand. The station breaks, the credits, the ads, the commercials. Mm -hmm. And he was an amazing, wonderful painter. But he was a jazz drummer. So by that, he was like, <coughs> later on in our list of drummers, he was like, he was the, most, perhaps, one of the most right. influential, most, yeah, stayed. So so that was, uh, that would have been... The funny thing, I think that was before Louise. I just, I think it, well, Louise joined while that was going on maybe because I can remember uh, that I think Garth Katsky was still singing with us when we first met him. Remember we used to do broadcast record our recordings with CFQC too like where they would use direct to disc and they would record some of our shows I don't know we've got recordings from CFQC Brian had it early on so 65, 64, 65 would have been our 
routines on TV. But I can remember we were doing it when we were booking our own halls around the province. Like when we were going to Unity, we would tell them that we were going there and so on. So that would have been around uh, in 64, 65. And I think we taped it on Thursday night or something because we weren't, we would be available on Thursday night. We wouldn't be out of town pulling gigs. And then the kids would come down and dance. Like it was like local kids, but it was teens on TV. So there's always an audience and there was okay. an MC. Was it Morley? Jagger? I don't know. William? Yeah. I don't remember. There may be different names. But we would, it would play on Saturday, the show. But we would tape it on Thursday night. Did every episode have just one guest? Like you were the star of that episode? Yeah. And if it was like, was it a 30 minute program? I think so. So like you'd be playing like five songs at yeah, least? Yeah, that's something like that. Yeah, that was it, yeah. right. And people, the kids would dance. And the, inter and the guy would talk. And sometimes he'd interview the kids. And sometimes he'd interview us. And I think we would probably have to. We would probably have different stuff we would did every week. Like we would have a number of tunes that we did. Right. Just whatever. I just probably yeah. like leave the popular covers you were doing. At the and time. I know that we used to. Yeah, like we used to get a playlist every week of what was going to be the top ten that week of, and so the new stuff that was going to be played, the radio station would receive it. I don't know how they received it, but the guy would shoot it to a copy to us, and then we would go and rehearse. So we would have the latest tunes in our right. repertoire. Right. Do you remember any songs that you were like, wow, this is like our song? It's that this like, works for us? Yeah, it just works. It's like, wow, somebody's written the perfect song that we just, you know, it, it just seems it really us works down, for the perfect. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, early on, I remember, uh, I remember this Diamond Ring kind of died by mm -hmm. Gary Lewis. Lewis. Gary Lewis, right. Gary Lewis's son. God, that was a good song. Yeah, we did that. Garth sang it. And then when we had Brian Abbott with us, like he was a rhythm and blues guy and really jazz. We used to do the outskirts of town, I remember that, and stuff the mic down his bell with his sax and play a solo, and he'd take it out and he'd sing, Oh, I'm gonna move to the outskirts of town. Remember that. But then the Beatles with stuff would come along and we could sing these harmonies. I was all I was a holdout a little bit for the Beatles at the beginning, but then the harmonies like even she loves you, yeah, 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 yeah. And you what's that? Like seeing that ninth interval in there with the like those those chords, those six and nines. Okay. But then when they came out with She Love uh I saw her stand in there. She was just 17, you know what I mean. The rhythm of that was just, I, my mind just capitulated, okay, I, I like the Beatles. And so, but they just, every, I'm still working on Beatle tunes. Like, uh, in fact, like one of the first things I did was, I'm holding this classical guitar, but, you know, one of the things about being a lead guitar player in a band is like, it's, it's uh, great. Uh, you, you'd get to do these things, but then on Sunday when they're all asleep or something, and then someone comes to your house and says, oh, you're the guitar playing guy, play something for me. And you say, well, if the band was here, I could... <laughs> I could, you know. But without the band, like, what does the lead guitar player do? So I got interested in playing the guitar more as a solo instrument. And when I was 21, I got my first classical guitar. This isn't it, but if my if the interview is at my house, it's still there. It's still hanging on the wall, and I still play it. But then I sat down and I started playing like a like figuring like yesterday. But you see, I realized that everything on the guitar has to be arranged, unless it's composed on the guitar. But what they composed was the chords for yesterday because Paul McCartney sang it, right? So they were playing like you know like a rhythmic background. But I was I got kind of interested in, so I would sit and learn how to play the guitar like like as a solo instrument, and I can remember like, you know, I don't know if I can do it in this chair, but... So I was still playing that same arrangement from when I was like 21, you know. But I enhanced it a little bit.
etc. You see, like mm -hmm. so. So that's how I really learned how to play the guitar. Was like taking a tune that just sort of had so much in it for me, like yesterday with the cello, with the string string quartet mm -hmm. part in the background. Yeah. You start listening to those parts. So then I was also also interested in jazz and learning jazz chords and playing and so on. So that's what really wore where I moved on beyond being a lead guitar player in the Ponds because I was interested in more kinds of music. Like you just wanna you just wanna keep going on. You don't wanna be keep yeah. doing the same thing. Right. So